a very warm welcome to everybody to this Scripture Summer School. It's our first time presenting all the lectures online, and we hope that you'll find it enjoyable and interesting. You can always pause the lecture and go back over material on your YouTube channel. I'm going to go straight to the slides, and then we can follow the lecture together. So I've chosen to speak about cosmology and Christ in Colossians and Ephesians. The six presentations are as follows. An introduction to our new worldview, the present talk. Then Christ and the cosmos background. Colossians, two presentations. And Ephesians, two presentations. For this presentation, we're going to look at current worldviews. I'm going to begin with faith and reason, changing our worldview, the pastoral context, do our texts help us, questions for reflection, a task, and then a quick preview of the next step. So in general, as you know, faith and reason have a complex relationship in the different Christian traditions. There was a great disturbance of that relationship at the Reformation and in the time of Galileo and, of course, in the time of Darwin. And the assumption of many people is that faith has nothing to do with reason. And in our current context, believers also have to contend with what we may call evangelical atheism. Nevertheless, in the Catholic forms of Christianity, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Communion, and the Orthodox Church, faith and reason go together. Not that faith can be reduced to reason, but they don't contradict each other. Nevertheless, issues arise regularly in ethics, especially medical ethics, but also in our worldview, our cosmology. Uh, when we come to talk about the origin of the universe, then believers have to be in dialogue with current science. And there's a much wider question how to speak of God today, how to speak of Christ, and how to proclaim the gospel to today's culture and people. To notice our change in worldview, I'm going to take you back to the worldview of earliest Christianity, the inhabited world of the Roman Empire, which they call the oikumene, from which comes our word ecumenical. That was substantially the world view of Christianity until the great voyages of discovery in the 15th and 16th centuries. The missionary outreach effectively to the whole world took place chiefly in the 19th century, all challenging an earlier Christian opinion outside the church there's no salvation, extra ecclesiam nulla salus. So take a quick look to two pictures to show you. Here's Here's the world of early Christianity, a very small world where only a few people are Christian believers in a few significant places, as you can see on the map. Here's the world of world Christianity today, a very extended picture of the presence of the gospel right across the world. We can easily forget just how new this picture is. It's really only since the 19th century, looking back, I suppose, to the voyages of discovery in the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, that old worldview has been challenged by the Big Bang Theory and a different cosmology that we are all aware of, even if we don't know it scientifically in depth. And of course, it's immensely complex, and there's no doubt about that, Yet it has entered our awareness and consciousness. If you say Big Bang, people kind of nod in with familiarity. The time scale of the Big Bang is extraordinary. It generates both awe and wonder, and also a sense of our own insignificance in the whole plan. Curiously, it was first promoted by a Belgian Catholic priest and scientist. The Big Bang was born of the observation that Earth, other galaxies are moving away from our own at great speed in all directions, 
as if they'd been propelled by an ancient explosive force. And a Belgian priest called Georges Lemaitre first proposed this theory in the 1920s, when he made up the theory that the universe began from a single primordial atom. This idea was supported by Edwin Hubble's observation that galaxies are speeding away from us in all directions. It was also supported by the 1960s discovery of cosmic microwave radiation interpreted as echoes of the Big Bang by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. I'm aware that all this is immensely complex and I don't understand it, but some idea of our worldview is necessary if we're to talk about Christianity in the present day culture. To give a tiny bit of science, in the first 10 to the power of minus 43 seconds of its existence, the universe was very compact, less than a million billion billionth the size of a single atom, unimaginable for us really. It's thought that at such an incomprehensibly dense energetic state, the four fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear forces were forged into a single force. But our current theories haven't yet figured out how a single unified force would work. To pull this off, we'd need to know how gravity works on the subatomic scale, but we currently don't. And usually, we ordinary people are aware of this worldview without really understanding it, which is, I guess, to be expected. Here's a diagram of what it might mean, worth contemplating in your spare time at length. And it tells us that the universe is 13.77 billion years old. Humanity, of course, is only a tiny speck on that great, unimaginable time scale. This worldview changes the way we look at everything. What about the historical Jesus and the scandalous particularity of the incarnation? What about world religions? What about ecology and faith? What about cosmology and faith? And we come back to our earlier conviction that faith and reason actually go together. And proclaiming Christ today cannot ignore this new setting. It calls for dialogue. And handing on the faith can't be done without dialogue with that real culture in which we find ourselves living and working every day. The good news is the dialogue has already started a good while back. And I pick here five topics with some representative figures to help us to grapple with the dialogue. So if evolution, Théard Chardin, and an American writer, Beatrice Bruto, Cosmology, Ilya Dalio, very famous, and Richard Rohr. Redemption, Elizabeth Johnson and the critics of Anselm. And Ecology, Dermot Lane. So we're going to set the scene by taking a quick look at each perspective. Thierry Chardin was a French Jesuit priest, a paleontologist and a spiritual writer. He was part of the team which discovered Peking Man. And he was very exercised to integrate faith and the new scientific world view. And he tried in particular to join uh, evolution and faith. And he came up with a kind of language, cosmogenesis, the beginning of the cosmos, biogenesis, the emergence of life, nuogenesis, the emergence of mind, and Christogenesis, the next stage under the revelation in Christ. And this grand picture was based largely on Colossians 1, 15 to 17. In his writings, he tried very hard to integrate evolution and the Christian faith. And he was a pretty strong critic of the traditional doctrine of original sin as received from Augustine onwards. Here's some examples of his writing. In Christianity and Evolution, he wrote, at this very moment, we've reached a delicate point of balance at which a readjustment is essential. It could not, in fact, be otherwise. Our Christology, our understanding of Christ, is still expressed in exactly the same terms as those which three centuries ago could satisfy men whose outlook on the cosmos is now physically impossible for us to accept. And he also wrote, 
Whenever we try intellectually and vitally to assimilate Christianity with all our modern soul, the first obstacles we meet always derive from original sin. Original sin in its present representation is a constant bar to the natural development of our religion. It clips the wings of hope. We are incessantly eager to launch out into wide open field of conquest, which optimism suggests, and every time it drags us back into the overpowering darkness of reparation and expiation. More on that from Elizabeth Johnson. Beatrice Bruteau was an American writer, as you see there in the NCR obituary, a scholar, teacher, interspiritual pioneer, intrepid explorer of the evolutionary edge of consciousness. And she built her work on the vision of Théâtre de Chardin, taking seriously quantum physics and Trinitarian theology. She, the kind of vocabulary she used was freedom, what she called spondic personality and re relationality. For example, for her, matter was not static building blocks, but webs of energy relationships. And communion, God is relationship. Matter is relationship. Human life is relationship. And she called for a new metaphysics of nature, starting in relationality. You can see this in her writings. In her book, Freedom, If Anyone Is In Christ, That Person Is A New Creation, we read in two places, to enter by our transcendent freedom into Christ and to become a new creation means to enter by faith into the future of every person and at the very heart of creativity into the future of God. And in another paragraph, if I'm asked, who do you say I am? You know, Jesus, great question. My answer is, you are the new and ever renewing act of creation. You are all of us as we are united in you. You are all of us as we live in one another. You are all of us in the whole cosmos as we join in your exuberant act of creation. You are the living one who improvises at the frontier of the future. It has not yet appeared what you shall be. Working on the new cosmology, one of the most important current writers is Elia Delio, a Franciscan sister in Washington and an American theologian, as you see there, specializing in the area of science and religion with interest in evolution, physics, neuroscience, and the import of these for theology. She works at Villanova University, Washington, run by the Augustinians. She was also much influenced by Terre de Chardin, and to mention just two of her many books, the unbearable wholeness of being, God, evolution, the power of love, and personal transformation and a new creation, a book she edited in 2016. Uh, Ilia Delio is exciting to read, sometimes uses a challenging vocabulary and language. For instance, in the book From Tear to, From Tear to Omega, co-creating an unfinished universe, she writes, the discovery is of the 20th century science, especially Big Bang cosmology, universalism or cosmic wholeness and evolution, nature's openness to the future, ushered in two new dimensions of life, wholeness and futurism. Contrary to the ancient Ptolemaic cosmos of order, stasis and hierarchy, the Big Bang cosmos was now seen in its evolving capacity for greater wholeness and openness to consummation in the future. And in Christ in Evolution, she writes, Christ is the model for creation. So what happened between God and the world in Christ points to the future of the cosmos. It is a future that evolves the radical transformation, that involves the radical transformation of created reality through the unitive power of God's love. This universe, therefore, has a destiny. The world will not be destroyed. Rather, it will be brought to the conclusion which God intends for it from the beginning, which is anticipated in the mystery of the incarnate word and the glorified Christ. Another writer on cosmology is Richard Rohr, a Franciscan spiritual writer living in New Mexico. You see there has his own website. He's written many, many books. There's a list of some of them there. The one I was using was The Universal Christ, 
how a forgotten reality can change everything we see, hope for, and believe. He tries to offer an integrated vi vision of spirituality, ecology, and the cosmos. He writes as follows in The Universal Christ. Numerous scriptures make it very clear that this Christ has existed from the beginning. So he quotes there from John, Colossians, and Ephesians. So that Christ cannot be coterminous with Jesus. But by attaching the word Christ to Jesus, as if it were his last name, instead of a means by which God's present has exchanged all matter throughout history, Christians got pretty sloppy in their thinking. Our faith became a competitive theology from with various parochial theories of salvation, instead of a universal cosmology inside of which all can live with an inherent dignity. Right now, perhaps more than ever, we need a God as big as the still expanding universe. Our educated people will continue to think of God as a mere add-on to the world that is already awesome, beautiful, and worthy of praise in itself. Richard Rohr brought up the specific question of redemption. And this topic is faced full on by Elizabeth Johnson, a sister of St. Joseph, distinguished professor emerita of theology at Fordham. Again, she's written many books. You can see some of them here. And my interest, our interest here, is in her critique of the Anselmian doctrine of redemption. To, catching up with uh, Ter de Chardin's hesitations about the traditional doctrine of original sin. Anselm of Canterbury, who lived from 1033, 34 to 1109, was an immensely um, successful theologian. He asked himself the question, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? And he gave the following answer. Adam was a real historical person who committed original sin. God was offended and satisfaction was necessary. Only someone both human and divine could bring, up, bring about satisfaction. Thus, Jesus, God and man, had to die to make satisfaction to God's honor. His main work is called Cur Deus Homo, Why the God-Man. And in spite of the traditional use of his theory, Anselm actually offers an intense picture of God's graceful mercy. And um, Elizabeth Johnson comments, he may have been the most successful theologian ever. Now she criticizes the theory, which is the traditional theory of atonement and redemption in the West by, by making the following comments. It offers a disastrous picture of God. Resurrection is not integrated. The ministry and teaching are not part of salvation. There's a morbid spirituality of suffering and an ethic of submission to injustice, slavery, attitude to women, and so on. And we may add, Adam, of course, was never a historical human being in that sense, once you take on board evolution. And in that sense, there was no original sin event. Original sin as a description of the current state of humanity is one thing. Original sin as something Adam did to cause it is really something else. She writes, recall that what resurrection means in the concrete is not seriously imaginable to us who still live within the time-space grid of our known universe. Yet, the empty tomb stands as a historical marker for the God of creation, who can act with a power that transfigures biological existence itself. The Easter narratives witness that the crucified Jesus did not die into nothingness, but into the ineffable embrace of God who gives life and the first fruits of all the human dead. His destiny means that our hope does not merely clutch at a possibility, but stands on the irrevocable ground of what has already transpired in him. So does the great hymn in Colossians, which draws on the wisdom tradition and the history of Jesus in equal measure to proclaim Christ as the firstborn of all creation, the drumbeat of all things, repeated five times in this short text, coupled with references to all creation, everything, the encompassing things visible and invisible, 
and all things, whether on earth or in heaven, drives home the blessing of new life that flows to all creatures from the crucified and risen Christ. So taken from her book, Creation on the Cross, The Mercy of God for a Planet in Peril. Our fifth context is the current issue of, e of the ecological catastrophe in front of us. Of course, we're in dialogue with the document by Pope Francis, Laudato Si. It's the issue of our day, and Pope Francis hopes that it has been a wake-up call, a reminder that God is our creator, and we honor God by honoring the creation, and that faith is a communion with all our fellow human beings and with creation, with the animals and plants as well. Dermot Lane, priest from Dublin Diocese, has been very powerful in reflecting on the current ecological situation and recently wrote a book called Theology and Ecology in Dialogue 2020. This is a, a, a big book, even though it's only a few pages. He's joining up theology, anthropology, who human beings are, pneumatology, the Holy Spirit, Christology, eschatology, the end of time, liturgy, and the Eucharist, a kind of vast project in a book under 200 pages. And he writes in that book, a second example of wisdom Christology can be found in Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Whenever Christ is given a role in creation or is present at the beginning of things, the intention is that Christ is taking on the role previously given to the figure of wisdom in the sapiential literature. Creation is the expression of God's desire out of love to share God's self with the world. That self-communication of God in creation finds its fullest realization in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as wisdom personally embodied in the flesh of Christ. God implants, as it were, a dynamic orientation within creation through the gift of word, spirit, and wisdom. So these contexts and these writers open up windows and establish a dialogue with the emerging scientific consensus. It's a lot of stuff, of course, and somewhat unknown to us, but at the same time, thrilling and exciting. So we as, as believers need a big reimagining on several levels, pastorally, to be able to speak to our times, spiritually, to be able to connect with the great issues of the day, and theologically in understanding how Christ and creation go together. We can always ask, well, where to from here after that grand opening and vision? I'm very struck by two writers, one contemporary, one has did a couple of years. The first is J.P. Meyer, who's been writing a study of the historical Jesus. The other is Raymond Brown, who wrote the introduction to the New Testament. They present contrasting pictures which can focus us. As you see in the fifth volume of A Marginal Jew, J.P. Meyer writes, the Jesus we have found throughout A Marginal Jew presented himself to his fellow Palestinian Jews as the eschatological prophet in the mold of Elijah, sent to Israel at the climax of its history to begin the regathering of the whole people, a people prepared for the coming of God's definitive kingdom by a radical doing of his will according to the Torah as interpreted by Jesus, as researched to the historical Jesus. By contrast, Raymond Brown, in his introduction to the New Testament, reflecting on the hymn in Colossians, writes as follows. The Colossian hymn professes that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, God's Son, in whom all things were created, in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through whom all things were reconciled to God. How, within 50 years at the latest, did Christians come to believe that about a Galilean preacher who was crucified as a criminal? Like the other New Testament hymns, Colossians 1, 15 to 20 offers a challenge to understanding the development of New Testament Christology. Given the fact that most scholars judge hymns in the Pauline letters to be pre-Pauline or non-Pauline in origin, 
one should note where high Christological statements in those hymns are similar to statements in the prose of the undisputed letters. For instance, compare Colossians 1.16 and 1 Corinthians 8.6. The summary of these two writings put it up to us. The historical Jesus and then the understanding of Jesus quite soon after his death as involved in the creation of the whole universe. So, some questions for reflection before the next presentation. Imagine you would like to explain to a friend the substance of this reflection. How would you do it briefly and effectively? Did any of the writers strike a chord with you? Given this emerging picture, what do we have to let go of? And given this developing picture, what are we definitely holding on to? A task, a short task. As just as a spiritual practice, why not try and compose a prayer for our time, understanding Christ in the context of the cosmos and the emerging picture we have of the world? Our next step will be to focus on the hymns in Colossians and Ephesians. However, the portrait of a cosmic Christ in those texts requires some background. So before going to the texts of Colossians and Ephesians, we're going to look at the wisdom traditions of the Jewish scriptures, the understanding of resurrection at the time, philosophy at the time, and the early appearance of Christ devotion. I look forward to welcome you to the second presentation and thanks for your patience. I'll shut down the sharing now and say goodbye properly. So that's a whirlwind tour of where we can find ourselves in religion, faith and cosmology today. I hope it hasn't been too much and on the contrary that it has quite your appetite to read our New Testament texts with fresh eyes so they can speak to us properly today. Thanks very much everybody.